Okay, I think I always <laughs> always have to wait like five seconds just to make sure everything's working. So let me just <laughs> double check. But uh, good morning, everybody, uh, to the Thursday morning fundamentals class with Keir Franklin. That is me. Um, I am first year tattooer and here to help you guide through the fundamentals of art and um, tattooable images. Lately this month, we've been doing uh, anatomy alongside Guy Atchison and Ricardo Sturdivant in their classes, uh, the Monday night exercise and the Tuesday morning exercises. Um, everybody's been doing a great job this month, really getting through anatomy. I know it's all difficult and crazy and strange, um, but everybody's doing such a good job. This week is probably the last week that we're going to be doing it. Um, so we'll count this as our final. Um, so I kind of came up with a little bit more of a challenging assignment or exercise that you could do to help you understand anatomy. Uh, we've been really focusing and honing in on the head and skull and um, face, nose, eyes, all that fun stuff. Uh, so we'll close everything out with learning about the planes of the face. And this will lead into our next little section, which will be concentrating on just values. Um, and it was kind of a little bit more difficult this week for me to come up with some sort of outline um, because we haven't really touched base on values uh, besides the sphere, cube, and cylinder that I did in the beginning. Um, so we'll, I'm going to try and keep this as fundamental as possible and try and get people um, who are just starting out in art or who are just starting out in learning anatomy, um, if it has gathered your interest, to get your brain to uh, recognize pleasing shapes, uh, understand value a little bit more and pretty much why fundamentals are important, which is what I touch base on every single week. Um, with that, if you are new to this, uh, I don't really explain that often, but if you are new to this, um, I pretty much let everybody zoom in a little bit later on, just so it gives you some time to really learn and listen, take some notes, all that fun stuff. Um, so I will be posting it in the chat group of the, or the uh, chat section of the um, Reinventing the Tattoo exercise group. Um, or you can just watch show in the events uh, if you are watching live. Um, and I will post the link and announce when I am posting a link so you can join on and ask any questions, comments, concerns, um, any of that fun stuff. Uh, so, Let's get started, but I did forget to make my iPad the co-host so I can screen share. So give me one second. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. So I had everybody do eyes, nose, and mouth uh, last week. I unfortunately only had time to do the eyes that I had started last week, um, but we did have one submission of a set of eyes as well. Um, <clears throat> and that's our good friend, Kyle's. Um, I think week by week, we can really recognize what's Kyle's work already, which I think is honestly quite inspiring because it took me quite some time to really uh, get through my fundamentals and, and understand who I was as an artist, as far as what attracts me most. And it, it truthfully wasn't until somebody else told me uh, what, I had noticed or what my, you know, style quote unquote was. So, you know, hats off to you, Kyle. Um, so you did these eyes, they're, you know, very well done. Let me make sure I'm on the right layer this time, everybody, you know. Uh, very well done. I really liked the layouts of these. I like the colors, all that fun stuff. Um, just some fine tuning tweaking that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so pretty much, First and foremost, we're, I'm obviously going to talk to you about the color that's here. Uh, so when you do any skin tones, and I think I did talk about this last week, that you do want to pay attention to whatever undertone the skin is. And so I like how you have your gradients in here. They're, they're in here very nice and smooth and subtle, and I really like that. Um, nothing besides this top left lid here is really like extremely, you know, you know, shaped out. Um, which is fine too with portraits and eyes and nose and everything like that, uh, which we'll get into later. But uh, make sure I'm gonna have the thing here. All right, so, so let's start with this bottom one here. 
and I'll try and you know go through this a little quickly just so you know yeah I, I could talk all day about color so we'll, we'll try and make it quick <laughs> so you have this bottom lid here and as you see I, I did color select like a more muted purple um so anytime you want your skin tone to be a little more of the caramel color orange skin tone ish um, you do want to combat it with a complementary color underneath it, just so it has a nice transition from warm to cool. Um, so in this case, it would be purple, and I would throw that in your darks just ever so slightly, right? And just to give it some separation. and give it a little bit more life. Because in, uh, you know, in nature and people, we are very multi-toned, even though it's normal for us to think of it as a whole, one whole gradient or one whole color, I'm sorry. Uh, and that is because we're just thinking of it as its whole rather than you know the little tiny things that are inside of it which is what makes color so confusing really it's just one transition from the other so that's pretty much what i'm doing here i'm pretty much you know doing this in a sloppily crazy way but you can tell that i kind of made a more transition from warm to cool rather than staying in the same hue and just picking different values which is what you did here okay this is you know one transition from you know going across the board this way rather than just sticking within the same hue and going up and down okay i hope that makes sense um but i would do that as like an underlayer you know, so you could put down your complementary color as your undertone and then throw these oranges right on top and it would actually, you know, mute itself out and not be so saturated um, because that's kind of how it is naturally uh, on people. Uh, other thing, uh, when you're doing the colors of the eyes, you definitely want to use kind of like the same same thing all around you kind of want to use different variations between warm and cool um and I, I think you're definitely ready to start using color to your advantage uh, and start learning about temperature but overall value wise right like if i had i had this color down here that's leaning into the warmer area. So then I gotta just travel into the cools for a little bit. <clears throat> just remember that your top lid does kind of have a little tiny cast shadow over your eye. Kind of almost goes halfway down at some times, depending on where the eye is sitting. That happens a lot in animes. Uh, you can see that a lot of the times the top lid is a little bit bigger. And it kind of gives it a little bit more depth here. Uh, and then that's when you can kind of go in with the more saturated, warmer blues here and start detailing it, which we will also, you know, talk about. Sorry, that's usually the darkest part. So once again, nothing super crazy, but just Honing in on, on certain things, um, noticing your pleasing shapes, all that fun stuff. Uh, but overall, Kylie, you did an amazing job. Uh, really proud of you. I really like the way that the eyes are shaped. These eyelashes, I like these eyelashes that are right here. I think those are really nice. I think that you could have gone without these ones here um, because anything that is facing in front of you is usually uh is not seen or doesn't necessarily need to be drawn out uh for it to make sense and for you to know that those are eyelashes um varying them in in shapes or i'm sorry in lengths you know so doing like the big medium you know small situation which is a common thing working in your threes okay so that way you have some sort of variation 
Um, but overall, great job. Um, fantastic. These were my eyes that I messed with. Um, and you can see I did talk about here, I do have some orangey tones um, right in this top right. But if you did watch my uh, class last week, you did see that I did throw purples right underneath it. So that way when I did apply like this tone that's here, it you know did its own variation of darkness and it kind of turned into these burnt umbers that are right here naturally without having to put those in there. Um, and if you kind of see it as a whole, the most saturated tone really is this one little orangey spot. The rest of it's kind of muted and pale looking. Um, but yeah, I completely forgot to put eyelashes. Uh, I, did. <laughs> I honestly, when I was looking at them, as soon as I hit live, I was like, I didn't put any eyelashes. So I do apologize, but I do have some sort of on this bottom one here, I do have some like little tiny dots of eyelashes. Um, or to indicate that the eyelashes are there. So my apology. <laughs> uh, so let's hop right into it, shall we? Let me take a sip of my coffee, like always. Uh, but we are going to be doing a review real quick, uh, just in case this is anybody's first time here. Um, I have to stop saying um. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do a quick review of our sphere and cube. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing on <clears throat> our basic fundamentals today. And I say that probably about 50 times per class. That's fine, we are. This is a fundamentals. So fundamentally, we are only going to be focusing on your highest point, your midtone, your darks, and this fun terminator line that's right here, okay? And if you are unfamiliar with that terminator line, it just means that that is the brim or darkest plane on your surface uh, where it turns from light family into dark family. Because I talk about families and relationships with my mediums all the time. And we really need to understand and start really separating the families of lights and darks right where this purple line is, you know, that is the separation between your lights and all the way down the bottom is your darks. Two, two separate things, okay? But yet they do work together as a whole. And this terminator line is that brim that tells you, okay, you're now in the dark family, okay? And that includes your reflected light that is still a part of your dark family. You need to have respects for these. If you do not understand up to this point, then you do need to go back to the basics because planes are a difficult thing to understand if you do not know your fundamentals of value. Um, also cast shadow, which is what's on the bottom here. Okay, so pretty much, obviously, if your light source is facing this way, you're going to have a shadow casting down on your object, and that's what really brings it up to that three-dimensional form. <clears throat> and last but not least, everybody hears me talking about this all the time, which is your ambient occlusion. And your ambient occlusion is scientifically, realistically in the sense where the light does not exist. That is the point where no matter what, even if it's bouncing off of the surface, it's not going to hit this spot here okay good example out in nature always is underneath a tire so right underneath your tire you have obviously when it hits the ground but as you're coming up on it right and this is your ground as you're coming up on off of it as it's turning you have this gap here that doesn't get any light and it's always dark you know always it's the black is black of black Okay, so keep these in mind, keep these terms in mind uh, when we move on and keep going, because once again, planes are a difficult thing to understand if you do not know your basic, basic, basic shapes and values. 
next we have our cube, okay? And this is where we're really starting to understand the definition of planes, okay? Uh, if this light source was hitting this cube at this angle, okay? This is kinda what it would look like. And if we were talking about planes, we could think of something in the same manner, okay? <clears throat> So if we took this, I'm gonna change the bit my color. It's not a fun color. So if the, obviously the light was hitting this way, right? And, and let's pretend that this is just a piece of paper, right? So let's pretend it's just this white area. If we turned this white plane upwards to face this direction, it would now change value because the light source is still up here still coming down this way, but it's not hitting it with that extreme force. So the value is going to change. So that's one plain flat surface of a value that is you know, correct. Same thing would happen on this side here, okay? Even though that's not you know your absolute black and there still would be some light hitting it, it still would be the darkest plane darkest value, that even coded shape, okay? And <clears throat> Ricardo is almost famous for pretty much talking solely on pleasing shapes and finding those pleasing shapes. And this is the stepping stone to getting to that point of understanding that, especially when you're doing portraits or any composition, finding those pleasing shapes to apply your values is the same road as learning planes, Okay, because you're finding that pleasing shape to apply one value that's going to tell the story for the composition, period. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to have you sit on that for a second. Okay. Un really wrap your head around your, your fundamentals. But what I really want to touch base on, and this is like a two second thing, I swear to God, is choosing a proper reference photo. And this is going to help you study your planes more than anything, especially nowadays with how easily accessible Google is and Google images are. Okay. There is no excuse, and I'm putting my foot down, no excuse to have a bad reference photo. Okay. Because if it just is not going, if the reference photo is bad, you cannot expect your image to be, you know, well put together. You're just setting yourself up for failure and that's not going to bring yourself any further in this industry, period. So there are reference photos that can do different things, right? But this is solely based off of a value study, what could be a tattooable image and what's going to help you in the long run. OK, so this is just, you know, three examples of some bad reference photos. OK, let's start. Ready? This one is a clear image. It's a little blurry, but that's just because I zoomed in down and messed with it. At, when I did upload it, it was a clear image. But what's wrong with it is I can't define any values in the face besides the hair and where the nostrils are and obviously the eyes and mouth and nose. Even though that is the first thing that you see on a face that is recognizable, it's not the most important and it's not going to help you out. It is the cherry on top to the rest of the composition. What's most important is placing your values. Now myself, I've been studying these, this anatomy for only three years and I have so much more to learn, but I can see, make sure I'm on the right gosh darn layer. I can see the planes here but that's just because I, I can know where they sit. So I could maybe mess with it. But as far as somebody just learning and trying to understand planes of the face, don't step near an overexposed image that's like, th like this, okay? Something that is blurry, even though I can see the values that are here, some common shapes aren't really showing. So they're not gonna be so clear when I render them on a flat surface, two-dimensional image. Okay. And obviously, you know, having a reference that's too far away. If I were to upload this image and it was naturally this small, you know, if I, especially if I'm working on digital, I'm going to have it up in the corner like this and I can't really see nothing. 
yeah, I can see certain values and yeah, I can see the overall kind of silhouette, but as far as detailed goes, it's, it's not going to work well for me. Okay. So every reference kind of has a place, but this is what you want to look for. Okay. Do you see, make sure I'm on the right layer. Okay. Do you see what's happening here? Do you see that cutoff, that Terminator line? <laughs> and yes, I'm pounding on my desk because this is very important. This is the separation of your darks and your lights. This has all of the information for you. There's This is a perfect reference photo to go off of. Now, children are a little hard to do because they have less of a bone structure formed. So a lot of things are going to be a lot softer, but here and now, this is great for value study. Okay. Same thing with over here. You see this? Wow. <laughs> Same thing here. That's its own shape by itself. I hope you're, you're starting to notice this, okay? So if we only looked at the darks, right? Let's, let's look at this one. If we only looked at the darks, you can start to see these pleasing shapes starting to happen, okay? Once again, I'm gonna say it again. You're leaving breadcrumbs for yourself to make a better composition rendered and to study better. You could easily see all of the simple fundamental terms that I just said on the sphere and cube easily in these portraits. You don't need to be a master at portraits to understand it. It's already there in front of you, all of the information that you need, okay? This one here, okay, her values aren't extreme. And when I did upload this image, it was clear. So please don't mind me. But what you could use this for is a simple study on where your proportions lay because it, or even better, you can take this into, if you go into the little magic button on, if you're on Procreate and you go into curves and you kind of take that little bar and drag it down you can exaggerate the values a little more if you wanted to do a study. But here and then, she's got beautiful features to reference off of, okay? And this is a important, important statement, and I want everybody to write this down, okay? Especially if you are feeling bad every time that you're using a reference, okay? If you feel like that gross gut feeling of like, ugh, I'm using a reference again, I can't even make a composition out of my head? Like, am I even an artist? Think about this statement and this statement only, okay? Manipulate your reference. Do not be manipulated by your reference, okay? So if I was using her as a reference for a female portrait I wanted to do, I instantly would be like, I really like that nose a lot. And I really like the way that her mouth is shaped. And I really like the direction of the eyes. And I like her high cheekbones. So everything else I can exaggerate in my own, right? But that comes, that part comes with time when you learn the planes of the face and all of the anatomy fun stuff. But that's how you can start to use your references. You can use it for that way in anything. If I want to make a tree, you know, I don't want to copy the entire tree that I see. Okay, I can just be like, oh, I like that branch and the way that it sits on top of that tree like that. I like the way that tree stump is shaped. I'm going to do that. And you're going to take bits and pieces and combine them together. Okay. Just, just a note, just to, you know, maybe that'll help you out. Uh, for my color freaks out there, your color portraits, uh, have to have a nice variation of value still. 
okay? First off, love this portrait, okay? But you can still see the pleasing shapes that are happening here. You see that? They're still there and it's it's its own shape. That's, you can fill in this whole thing and I'm gonna show that in a second. You can fill in this whole thing, one tone, one plane, and it would still map out to a very well looked portrait. <laughs> Um, this is our sorrow head. Okay. This is just for people who really, 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 really love anatomy. And for people who want to understand the way that light is moved and sits on objects. Okay. This is by John Asaro. And he came up with this head here. Okay. And the website for all of more information on this head is right on the bottom. You can screenshot it, write it down, all that fun stuff. Um, they are doing orders of this head and other heads that they have, mannequins, all that fun stuff that show the planes of the face. Okay, this is a very extreme version of the planes of the face, but you are seeing here, this isn't a different head each time. It's the same head He's just taking a light source and applying it onto the head as shown, okay? And remember last week how I, when I talked about the lips, I talked about how there's a downward and upward to all planes. Like they all have their own shape. Go down, they go up, they go left, right. Well, that's how the light travels. That's how you're defined by your, your planes. But this, and it, for fundamental reasons, is the best example because you can see where that line is. Okay? So this is a great resource to learning the planes of the face. Okay, I'm gonna go one step further. Okay, the separation of all, of your two families, respect them. Give your art the respect it deserves. Give yourself the respect you deserve. When trying to learn, don't make it more difficult for yourself by only giving yourself like three values to work with. And those values are one, two, three. That's not fun. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna give a second so you can read this quote here. I am not gonna read out loud. I'm very bad at it. Um, but he pretty much created this Asaro head. He has two sides of this head. One is the more simplistic version which is this side here. Uh, well, that's for like younger children, young adults, um, more simplistic planes, whereas the right side is for the more advanced uh, adult planes of the face. He has male and female versions of them, um, <clears throat> as well as, like I said, mannequins as well. Uh, I recommend that everybody check this out. There is also a website um, that I could put in the group exercise uh, community that has an app that pretty much has the Asaro head that you can lay a light on. But I'm one of those people that really likes some, an object I can touch and really play with on, you know, <clears throat> a more three-dimensional factor of it. Um, I do not know how much they go for, but I just wanted to make this as a disclaimer for a great resource that you can use for your faces and heads and everything. Um, Throughout this whole little section here, I really hope that everybody was kind of seeing the shapes that were being made and their resemblance to the skull. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee, hold on. Just sit with this picture for a second. Okay. 
Okay. Very fundamental fact right now. Okay. As you're studying both of these right now, I hope that you are really seeing the similarities. And if you're not, and if you really are just starting out, it may be a little more difficult for you and that's okay. I'll extend an olive branch. Ha <sighs> ha. <laughs> Isn't it so cool? <laughs> Now, in the beginning, I kind of said something a little harsh in the statement of if you do not understand your basic values, you cannot understand this plain to the face. And this is why. How am I, if I don't even, A, know how to draw a skull properly with its proper values, B, understand where values are supposed to go and the respects they deserve, <laughs> if, if I'm trying to learn how to do anatomy and do planes of the face and trying to draw like the best Robert Downey Jr. portrait I've ever seen in my life. Don't put yourself on that pedestal yet. Give yourself time. Art is supposed to be fun. You're supposed to have a good time. And yes, it is frustrating. And yes, anatomy is a difficult thing to learn. But if you break it down to these basic fundamentals, it can be fun too. Okay. Think, I think of every face you look at now just like this, okay? Especially if it has a direct light source on it like this. Now, these both have a little bit different light sources and all that fun stuff, but the planes still have the same relationship to each other, okay? <clears throat> a couple things I want to point out. Make sure I'm on the right layer. This shape that you've heard me talk about and preach. This shape that's here, okay? Then you have your, well, you know what? We'll count for fundamental reasons. We'll count this whole plane, the whole frontal area. <clears throat> okay. And this. Okay. So these planes here, okay, you can think of them. You've seen them in math. These are basic shapes here. When you have a light source, let's say it's coming from here, what is already starting to happen? Mm-hmm. It's basic, basic shapes. Break them down, okay? The reason I'm pointing this tr these triangles out is because these, that's, in my opinion, in my opinion, one of the most important planes and most de defined planes are these planes that are right here. The cheekbone and, whoop, we'll back it up then. <clears throat> and this portion that's right here, which is the zygomatic, I believe, that's how you pronounce it, okay? The most defined shape, which is your, your cheekbone area, okay? And that always has a downward slope to it. And that's usually where, you know, your darkest values are depending on where your light source is coming from. And I'll show that in the next slide here. But my main focus on this is the difference between your lights and your darks, which is your reds and that lime green that's there. <clears throat> and the similarities to the skull and the planes of the face. <laughs> because I know for some people who are just starting out that saw the Asaro head and got freaked out that they're supposed to know exactly where each of those planes are, which is exactly what I thought as soon as I saw the Asaro head. As soon as my mentors showed me that, you know, planes of the face, I was like, oh my Lord, that's a lot to memorize. Break it down simpler than that, okay? What is underneath your skin and muscles? It's your skull, okay? That tells your true form of where your light and your dark are gonna sit and where you can see it most happen, okay? So obviously, 
inside the eyes, you're going to have some darks because your eyes are sunken into your face. Okay. For the nose, obviously, that's going to be a lighter form usually because that's what's protruding out of your face. Okay. Your chin will have a direct light source just like over here because that's coming out of your face. Your bottom lip will always be lighter than your top lip because like I said last time, your bottom lip is a surface. It's not a fold like the top lip, okay? <clears throat> and I'm pausing in between each of these little segments because it's a lot to digest. It really is. But if you break it down, you can, it will start to all make sense. And well, Kier, why aren't you going into the planes of the eyes, nose, and mouth? I kind of touched base on that last week. And truthfully, your eyes, nose, and mouth detail, like I said, is the first thing you recognize as, you know, is this Robert Downey Jr.? But you're really focusing on the planes as a whole first, as its own basic shape. Okay, understanding the direction that your planes will travel and how that correlates with the values that you're putting in and the light source. Be respectful of it. Break it down. I showed you the Loomis method for a reason. So when you did put in that circle, you could also understand like, okay, this is a rounded surface. This is a sphere. So what's going to happen with that sphere as soon as I add some value to it? It's going to take form. Okay, same thing with the shape that comes down here. What's going to happen when you add a light source onto it? It's going to have the same contoured look. Okay. And then everything else that's in between it is just the stuff that sinks in, that comes out, that sinks back in. And that's just basic shapes that you're seeing. Okay. So I have been, if you've been following me on Instagram and everything like that, I've been posting up some portraits um, just to get my hands warmed up to them because this is the final and the assignment that I have for you guys will be challenging, but I'm pretty excited to see, even for myself, I don't even know how well it's gonna go for myself, um, how, how this is all gonna go, but uh, ignore the nose, okay? Lord has told me to start practicing nose planes again, and this is a clear face of it, okay? Ignore that nose. I know the proportions are off a little bit. My accuracy, it's not 100% there. Don't mind me. Okay, but this is a good example as to if you do not understand, once again, for the third time, do not understand your basic fundamentals of basic shapes and forms. You cannot expect yourself, even if, even if I see this here, right? And you can tell I tried to put in my values the way that I mapped out the rest of the face. Because I knew like, okay, cool. These are where my basic shapes are. But then I don't understand the planes. I don't understand what direction this nose is supposed to be going in. So if I don't understand that, how am I supposed to understand how to do it when it comes to the final composition? Period. Okay. Good example. Um, so I did this to show another way to get your brain wrapped around the idea of planes and value and light source and all that crazy stuff we've been talking about today. So take a second to look at this real quick. And also good morning to everybody that is watching. I just wanted to check in and see here what's going on with everybody saying hello, hello. Uh, and let me take a sip of my coffee and we'll get right back to it.
Okay. So this is where I'm going to be talking about a, a process that you could do to <clears throat> study values because we're definitely going to be getting more into that next section. Um, but this is a good introduction. So you can see here, I have a portrait and you can see the reference that's on the left. And you see these markers that are here. All in here. Okay. See that? And uh, this is done with big pen just to throw that out there, okay? So you see those markers and how they're going in the same direction. I wanna point that out severely, how they're going in the same direction besides what's down here, because I had to, uh, I showed some, you know, other directional light, uh, uh, darkness, sorry, cast shadow. Uh, but everything else that's up here, Jesus. Everything else that's here is of one direction. And the reason I'm doing that is to show a value and what direction it's flowing in, okay? And this is a easy start to cross-hatching technique as well, okay? So you start out with your darkest tones in that shape. So I pretty much, you know, mapped out the head the Asara way. You can see where I mapped the ear to the eyes, and I brought down my line of action here. Okay, and then I started to see this basic shape that's happening right here. And no, it's not exactly perfect, but it's, I did it with pen, like I drew it right out. Okay, I put it right into the hairline, right to the edge, and you can see that there's some reflected light right here. So I made sure to put that in. Okay, some behind the ear, and then I saw this cast shadow that's happening down here. And I did the same thing, just a little more simplified. Okay. And then it was already starting to become clear to me where the forms were just by simply having that outline. But you can see it's all relatively, with small variations, the same value. So why can't I just go in there and apply that value in here firsthand? I'm gonna back up because I have slides that have that. Come on, Kier. Okay. Establishing your darks. So I established it in here, sawed off that terminator line, and applied my darks. Okay. I did apply some darks in here as well, but that I should have counted as um, a light because it technically is still in the light family. But it's in here, all my darks. <clears throat> then what you go into is your light family. Now that you have your dark family established, ready to go, you can apply your light family, okay? And you may need to darken up your <clears throat> darks, but establish that light family first. Because what will happen is as soon as you start to add a darker tone to what's already dark family, those darker tones are actually gonna start to get lighter as it starts to take shape. <clears throat> so you may need to go in there and darken up a little bit but wait till make try and wait till the end to do that because what may happen and what happens to me a lot is then i'll start to darken up the darks and keep darkening it and keep darkening it and then all of a sudden it's too much of the um same plane and there's no variation between the shapes anymore especially if you're doing big pen and and cross hatching techniques <clears throat> um 
from there. Throw in your highlights, okay? And in this reference, he doesn't have any, a lot of extreme highlights, um, but I kind of extreme put them in extreme sense, just so you can kind of see the shapes. And usually the tops of the cheeks create like a little triangle type shape or like it's a little oval right on the tops here because that's the highest point of the cheekbone. And depending on the light source, that's where the cheekbones will usually get majority of the light. But do not match this value with this value on the other side. Okay, this value is reflected light. This value, which is what I made, is a highlight. Okay. So don't, don't do that. Give it the respect it deserves. Okay. And then after all said and done, and it looks like this, obviously it's a little bit messier, but when it looks established, all your values, you can go in and start adding ambient occlusion. Okay. Really start to bring it to life. <laughs> and this will all come together and be a lot easier for you to study when you understand your basic fundamentals. When you take it piece by piece, one step at a time, okay? Now, this does not look exactly like the little boy on the left, for sure. Um, definitely needs some fine tweaking and tuning, but the planes are readable. It's a face. It looks like a face. And in that instance, that's when the awesome line comes in that if your values are correct, it's a readable composition, okay? <clears throat> now I could 100% go in here and darken up these sides of the face here, emphasize this line. Um, and if you hear my cats running around, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, just to emphasize that Terminator line. All right, you can go in here and start to smooth things out. Really focus where your shapes are, but you can see that, you know, th these are pleasing shapes. And then if you keep practicing it in this manner, repeatedly, 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 as I can't say that seven times, okay, then you can start making portraits out of your head. Because you understand, okay, as long as I understand where the light source is, then I can, and I understand my skulls, and I understand where all my proportions are supposed to be, then I can go in here and just start mapping out a nose just by these basic shapes. And that's exactly what Ricardo does, okay? But he thinks of it as a skull first. So he'll go in here with this shape of the eyes and start mapping out all these simplistic forms and immediately make it a three-dimensional object, which I think is so is so awesome. It's a very painterly of a technique to do. Um, but for absolute beginners, please, 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 please just go back to your basic fundamentals. Okay. You can always come back here if this if this topic is making you frustrated, if this homework assignment makes you very frustrated, that just means that you need to go backwards a little bit. And that's okay. I need to do that all the time. Everybody needs to do it all the time. Remembering your fundamentals. They're always there for you to help you out. They're not there to make you feel like you're not any, you know, any less of an artist. Okay. And I think that needs to be said. <clears throat> okay. I think I'm done talking. Um... <laughs> So you're, I was thinking a lot about what I would do and let me stop screen sharing for a second. What I would do for a uh, assignment or exercise, because you don't necessarily have to do these. These aren't like required, um, but these are just tips and tricks to help you achieve what you want to achieve. And to also most importantly, to, <clears throat> get your brain, eyes, and mind to see these shapes, to understand these basic fundamentals. So that way you can trust yourself as an artist. And that's important. 
Well, if you trust yourself as an artist, then you can make anything you want without care in the world, really. You can get into that flow state easier. You can understand the compositions that you want to make. And it all just comes down to your basic fundamentals. Um, secondly, side note, I uh, don't want to change topics completely. But um, one, if you are seeing my face right now, Kyle, I want to point out the color thing again real quick. So you see, and my camera's really bad, but under my eyes, you can see that like purple tone. There's that purple undertone right here. But then right here, if you can see it, it's like that yellow ochre color. And then there's like this vast shape of peach that follows that bone that I was telling you guys about. And it comes down to the cheekbone, which is that center part of the skull, right? It's all planes of the face. You can tell my Terminator line right here. Separation of light and dark. It's all there. Take Do self-portraits. Uh, that's what I was going to do today. But uh, I actually decided to make it a little more challenging. So what I want you guys to do is find a good reference photo. Okay. And make it into a skull rendering. Find out the skull bones that are underneath it without tracing. That is your assignment. Full value study of whatever portrait you're looking at as a skull, okay? Um, also announcement, I will, fun times, I will be taking over the, um, not sure, it's, I shouldn't say taking over, that's rude. I will be joining the, um, and hosting the Monday morning drawing groups um, starting this Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. It just gives a great opportunity for everybody else to come hang out again. Um, I took a quite a hiatus from reinventing, posting, and being active, um, but it's definitely time to keep it consistent and come back. So um, join me this Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern, for some fun times. I uh, come bring any medium. I'll probably work on the painting that's behind me. If you want to talk about color, if you want to talk about composition, any of the things that I've said in my class that you may disagree on, love to discuss it. Um, come join in, zoom in, and it'll be super fun. And with that said, I will allow people to start zooming in now. Um, so let me post it up in the comment section. And I do have a hard out at 1130, but that's, I think it's enough time. Uh, Okay. Hope I'm posting it in the right one. <laughs> Let me make sure. Sorry, it's taking me a second to post it. Um, all right, let's see here. Posting it now. These headphones really hurt my ears. Oh, okay, I did post on the right one. Okay. All right, so I will wait for everybody to join. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> so uh, please, please don't mind me if I uh, do not become the greatest at this today's assignment. This is very challenging even for myself. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, we got somebody joining in here. Cool. We got the man, the myth, the legend. We got Ricardo Sturdivant. Coming in at the most perfect time to talk about pleasing shapes. What an amazing, amazing time. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> All right. 
let's see here. So I'm gonna have my camera facing like this. I'm not gonna screen share for the moment. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. All I don't right. have my headphones or anything with me, so sorry about that. That's fine. You don't have your fancy headphones, that's okay. No, I don't have my fancy headphones. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Well, how's it going? Going pretty good. Going pretty good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, right. Opened up my day today so I can come hang out. This morning, anyway. Nice. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. It's always a pleasure. So, the assignments. You want us to draw a skull from the portrait? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, usually you're building it up opposite, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think it was more to help everybody understand that the planes of the face revolve off of the planes of the skull besides obviously your nose because that protrudes out of your face where the skull it kind of sinks into it mm -hmm. so i think uh i don't know what do you think of that i think it's good do you want us to do a, do you have a suggestion on profile or three-quarter profile or anything I mean, it, it all depends on what you want to do, truthfully. I think skillfully, if you are just starting out, I think it's best to always do frontal face. But I always like to do three-quarter, honestly. Okay. Um, I think if you did side panel, it would be not a little bit more difficult to make a skull, but just maybe understanding planes of the face in relation to it, maybe. Because yeah, you kind of have half of the face. So right. either three-quarter or frontal, I think, would be best. Um Best for everybody. Color but, black and gray doesn't matter. No, it don't matter. Don't matter to me. Don't matter none. It probably be best to do a value study, unless you are a color freak. But you know, I'm not going to be the one to stop anybody from doing color. Because <laughs> I have everybody at my shop. I had everybody at my shop try raw pigments. And they pretty much said the exact same thing that we said when we first tried. I'm like, is it supposed to go in that smooth? Yeah, yeah seriously. No, I, I was like, it. yes, it is. <laughs> Why, yes, yes, it is. Don't worry. It's good. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's, and I know you can understand this from a universal perspective that, you know, the universe placed me in a shop with two very well black and gray artists <laughs> when I it very much revolve around color. It's a good mix. You're saying that you're learning more about color through black and gray values? Um, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of just more of I'm, <clears throat> we're bouncing off of each other. Like I'm starting to understand values in the way that they see it. And they're starting to understand how to place their values in the way that I see it because they think more, and this is just them personally and not saying all black and gray arts, but they think more in gradation where I think of more of paint by numbers, like that blocked off edge of a, you know, common shape or plane, like I was talking about today. And they mm -hmm. think of it more as like crescendo from darkest to lightest kind of thing. With, so, no, with no missteps. There's not even yeah. steps. There's like a slide. It's like a slide. Yeah, you just smooth it in there, you know? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what they're thinking. You're thinking like first step, second step, third step. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's easiest for me. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, I think right. a lot of black and gray artists think paint by numbers too. I don't think it's just you know, colorist, but just more commonly from what my experience is, I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I figured I would pick a assignment that is a little more challenging for everybody because I do kind of revolve around people who are just starting out. Um, but we have a new friend in here, our, our new friend, Makita. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Um, oh, I'm doing just dandy. Uh, Hello. Hi. you are a first timer on here and i think i talked to you a little bit on the instagrams and such so welcome yeah 
Thank you. Fellow Massachusettser. Yep. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Did uh, have you started out on your skull today, Makita? Um, no, I had some issues like coming in and out on the Zoom. Um, so I have to find a reference photo and I'm getting the skull out of that reference photo, right? Yes. So you're basically, so you're going to pick a good reference photo with a good light source where you can clearly see a nice Terminator line or cast shadow probably on one side of the face. And then you're going to find the skull that's underneath that face because it lives. Okay. All right, cool. So um, awesome. Thank you for so much for joining everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Nice to meet you. You too. I might be in and out um, because I have two kids running around screaming. <laughs> that's perfectly that's fine. General is an honor. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. So let's see here. So, Ricardo, do you have anything else you kind of want to add on? I mean, you, you've been talking about it for weeks on weeks about finding basic shapes. Um, and I know I think we've talked about it many times as well, that you've really always sought out those shapes. Uh, was that more of like a helpful thing for you in your beginning or did you kind of just find it along the way? Yeah, it's definitely something that I found along the way. Um, you know, when I first started out, it's funny because, you know, my mom had all this collection of these like uh, comic books that I was trying to draw. Like I had a bunch of Spider-Man and Wolverine comics and I was trying to draw them. And I always looked at those drawings now and I see that everything was just, I was trying to nail every single little line meticulously, you know? And what happened was whenever I sat back to look at it, I was always like, why is it so skewed? Why is why is this arm way longer than the other one? Why is this one shorter than the other one? You know, like I don't know how they do it. You know, and then the longer I practiced, the more I, I got into you know trying to mimic the line work and understanding that, especially once I started getting, started getting into tattoos and to becoming a tattoo artist, that's what I was focused on. Uh, and then once I started picking up oil painting and painting with acrylics and stuff like that a little bit more. That's when I started recognizing how simple these shapes are and these images that we, you know, come up against that we consider so complex and so uh, daunting. So I think it was that realization where I found that, that you call it flow state, you know, and I agree that it is definitely a flow state where you're kind of relaxed into the moment and you're like, you know, drawing and you're feeling good and you're just juices are flowing and universe is all good, you know? So like once I started recognizing those shapes, that's when it started happening. I started becoming a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, and I talk a lot about, I really liked when you touched on that fact of, you know, being able to recognize these shapes so much that uh, you can start drawing from your imagination a little bit more too. Yeah. It's, it's all a practice. It's all a, it's all a repetitive kind of practice, like a muscle memory development. Yeah, and that's that's a, an interesting point because, you know, and that's something that I had learned on my journey that I really wanted to rely on myself more as an artist, um, especially after a year or two of my apprenticeship, I was still relying on references and to the exact T, like I was just photocopying them, not realizing, you know, the skills that I was obtaining from it because I just saw this end result that I couldn't achieve yet. And I wasn't focusing on what was important in the moment, which was, you know, getting as many tools under my belt as possible. So that way I could trust myself with any composition that I think of, because thinking of a composition and actually being able to follow through with it thoroughly and uh, technically are two completely different things. Um, and that's important as, and you mentioned comic books and that's a great, you know, another way of, of learning planes, because that's all they do is they just use flat planes to set their value because it's quicker. <clears throat> it's a lot quicker to get through pages when you have just simple one flat color on these planes, rather than going in and, you know, rendering it to its realisticness. And that's, you know, I think that revolves around tattooing too. And even though I'm very young in this career, I can see that that's a very similar type of mindset to simplifying these shapes so it's a little bit easier to render and understand um, and it stays on the skin longer. So 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> and you can see that within your work. And I say that all the time to you, that you're, you have a very comic book style work. So <clears throat> it makes sense that that's how you learned your planes and, and oil paintings as well. I've seen many oil painters immediately do the same technical um, pattern that you do where you start with, you know, if you're doing a skull, you start with center of the eyes, the shape of that, and you just fill it right in. And then you do the nose and you fill that right in. So you are really going for the form of things where I'm the type that thinks about that outer edge shape. Um, so it's, it's very, very well done. <laughs> Thank you. And it's, it's interesting, like, okay, so uh, comic books, you know, I, I might be wrong, but what I read was that one of the reasons that they started developing that style was because it was cheaper to kind of print less colors. You know what I mean? So I always say this, I always say it, but necessity is the mother of invention. You know what I mean? Like when you have something that you need to do, you have to do it. And there's only one way to really do it. You start looking around for other venues. You start looking at, at this, 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 uh, this problem with, with some solutions that might be, you know, kind of thinking outside of the box. And I think as artists first, I guess it depends on how you view yourself really, right? Like you can be a tattoo artist first and then an artist second or vice versa, or you can try to do your best to marry the both of them, which is the constant struggle for me. Um, and I think it's okay to think outside of the box and approach it in different ways. And, you know, you develop a lot of different methods. You develop a lot of different styles that way. Um, and it's unique, you know, and you, you start developing your own voice and your own like um, rhythm and your own, you know, way of doing things too. And it's great because I can influence other people and then they in turn influence you as well. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, let me turn this call away. Sorry about that. I thought I turned my, my phone off. That's okay. Um, and the other part was, uh, we were talking about a little bit ago about the shapes and everything like that. I think that I appreciate you noticing that, uh, you know, when it comes to oil paintings and stuff like that, that's another thing that everybody thinks is so permanent. It's so permanent. Like the only thing that's really tight, uh, Permanent in what we do is our, our tattoos, right? And even then there's ways of being pliable as far as, or malleable, I'm sorry, malleable to where you can kind of, you know, take that, that permanence away, like by applying painting methods to some of the saturation techniques that we use, you know what I mean? So, and building it up, you know, and, but understanding that resistance of the skin only has a certain threshold and you have to avoid that, you know, but but then again, you know, it's thanks to people like Guy Atchison, you know, Nico Hurtado, uh, Paul Booth, you know what I mean? Philip Liu, uh, these guys that were starting to experiment with introducing these uh, methods that they've learned through painting and drawing into the tattoo industry. And without it, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we're at right now. You know what I mean? It's almost like this Renaissance kind of period in, in tattooing. And, and these guys were the, uh, the ones that were like, oh no, they invented this camera. And now what are we gonna do? We have to change it up a little bit more. You know, so, but yeah, um, the shapes and stuff like that, they just make sense that if, if you break everything down, they're, they're everywhere. You know, um, you see a little kid draw, they draw houses pretty similar, a square and a triangle, you know what I mean? A little circle for the sun. So. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's the best method to think about things, especially in art, you know, um, <clears throat> everybody says, and it's the, probably the most common phrase that everybody says when they look at your artwork and they're not an artist themselves. And they're like, man, I can't even draw a stick figure. Yeah, yeah. But realistically, right? Yeah. Realistically, the yeah. stick figure is where it starts. <laughs> exactly. That's the fundamental right there. Because if you yeah. draw like a gesture drawing, for example, what does it kind of look like? A stick figure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that. <laughs> I do. I tell people when they when I hear them say that, I, I grab a pen and paper, right? And I tell them, okay, let me show you. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to write it real fast. I tell them to write the letter A. Wait, let me pin you so you can see what you're doing. Okay. I'm like, write the letter A. Yeah. Right? So they write the letter A. I go, okay, now from the top of that A, just draw a straight line up. And they do it. Okay. Yeah. And then I tell them, make a line go straight across that top part that you just ended at. 
okay, they do it, right? And then I go, okay, now put a little circle on top of that, that cross section that you just made. And I go, what did you just make? Yeah, you just made a little person. You know, and the thing of it is, is like, I talk about this in, in the classes that I do is like contrast. Yeah. And what you're talking about establishing these shapes with like form. Like I do do that. I try to, I try to approach everything with the idea of, I want to nail down the light source first without having to look at it too much and then start tweaking on, on the shapes of everything after that. And their their spatial awareness to each other. Yeah. We all know how to write. We've all been taught how to write. And that is just the simplest form of contrast that there is. It's a dark image shape on top of a stark opposite con uh, of, of, the, of the tone, right? So whatever color it is, like I just use red, you can use black. And so it's black on white or red on white, or you know what I mean? It's like, so once we start wrapping our head around the idea that like what this letter is, it's the same thing as a skull. It's the same thing as a human face. They're just a little bit more variations to the complexity of these shapes and their special awareness to each other and the relationships that they form because of the light and shadow effect, right? Yeah. And I really liked when you touched on that, um, the ambient occlusion, like that is that gap. There is that, that stare and there's a space in between it where there has to be a relationship in order for the two to be married to each other. And that is that ambient occlusion. And that is that magic area where it starts to make that form really come together as a circle to a sphere or a triangle to a cone, you know? So I agree with you. That, that was really good that you touched on that because I've, I've forgotten entirely about that, that term. And uh, I always just say it's like um, there's these little nuances as far as the relationship between a dark value and a middle value. There's yeah. a range in between there that we're not talking about but the ambient inclusion is an important factor to take into consideration. You know, sure. Yeah, and it's especially in tattooing because absolute black is where you go, you know, and you see a lot of newer age uh, black and gray artists use a heavy amount of ambient occlusion. But as long as, once again, as long as it's in the correct plane, then it still reads as a composition. You know exactly what's there, You but... They're just making a image that's going to stay on your skin forever. And they figured out a way to do that. And that's just using a heavy amount of black, but in the right areas. <clears throat> and that's like any medium, right? There's a, there's a necessary kind of component to it. You yeah. Know, like, uh, some artists will go, um, you know, a la prima, uh, where they go, they use the oil inside of the oil paint itself to, to, to blend with and to, you know, to kind of push the paint around and stuff like that. So there's variations of the same basic knowledge of, of a base coat of uh, oil painting, which is usually it's a turpentine mix with like loose uh, amounts of, of pigment, right? Mm -hmm. with that, with that, so with that being said, you're right. There is some components that need to be established first, but there are variations on ways of doing it too though. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And that black in tattooing is, it's essential for sure. It's accessible. Without the right amount of it, it doesn't look good. Don't yeah. Too much. You just fuck it all up. <laughs> and I, I think it's very important too to mention that longevity is probably the most important thing that tattooers nowadays think about, which is why we try and talk out of those Pinterest tattoos so often. Because you don't want to, as an artist, you don't want to do a tattoo that's going to last four days. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though it looks sick on the picture. Yeah, but it's right there. Yeah, you exactly. You can't do it. It's right there. Look, it's right there. And the guy down the street said he could do it. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's just one of those factors that, unfortunately, is the separation between the viewer and the artist. The viewer only sees the ending result. We see the process that it takes to get there and the yeah. end result in the long term. Um, mm. And that's that's it, you know, uh, but it's, it's very important. And that's why I love doing these and why I'm kind of coming out of this hiatus, because these fundamentals are severely important for understanding that it, no matter how long you've been tattooing. Um, and I know you can speak for that for yourself since you've been tattooing, you know, what, like 18 years, 20 years. Uh, since 1998. So, so 23, 23 years. years yeah. And 
you have come to me, you know, when we all came together in the beginning and said that, you know, you are grateful that you're starting to learn these basic terms because it's starting to open your mind to so many different avenues. And that's all it does. That's all your fundamentals do is just like, hey, this actually exists in the fundamental sense. And no matter how much you put it or where you put it, it's still there, you know, and <clears throat> it separates the viewer from the artist because the viewer does not see those fundamentals. They see the detail, they see the bright colors, they see how pretty it is, they see the composition as a whole, yeah. where at the end of the day, it's the fundamentals that come first. It's that foundation. Yeah. And you cannot expect yourself to be the next Steve Butcher if you do not understand your basic fundamentals. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the thing, like Steve Butcher, especially, man, that guy's artwork is incredible, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and his tattoos are fucking awesome as hell. And uh, yeah, I think it's cool because you see these people that that's what's happening is that they've got a really good grasp on those ideas of these fundamentals. And then they're the ones that are pushing those to the extreme and figuring out how it's going to work. But without that knowledge of that basic fundamental, that wouldn't be the case at all. Mm-hmm. There's no stepping stone, right? There's no bridge. Absolutely. Um, and you're going to you know, enjoy this as, as well before I, I move on to asking Nikita some questions if she has the time. But yeah. I had a client come in yesterday and I was tattooing them and I always like to you know, conversate with all of them. And and my boss is teaching me how to communicate really well with people. And he's a mathematician major. And I asked him, you know, what he likes to get into as far as math goes. And he says he really likes fractal geometry. And I said, he's like, I really like repeating numbers. I'm like, oh, so you know about the golden ratio. And he's like, yeah, we were taught about that. I'm like, did they teach it to you and why it's important to art? And they're like, no, it's no, they never taught us that. And I was like, well, (laughs) and it pretty much got to a point where, you know, we were conversating about, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. And I even sent him all my notes that I took from here. And he had explained that it he he thought it was crazy that they didn't teach him about this at a college level as a major in math. They didn't teach him this avenue. They were kind of just like, this is what it is. And that's it. And I'm like, well, that's why it's important to have a community. And this is why it's important to get out there and and meet with different people because they may not teach it, but I'm teaching it to you right now because that's my realm of society. And it really resonated with him well, as far as, you know, coming together as a community and learning different things. And now he went home and learned something that, you know, his average math um major didn't quite know and that's its relationship you know from fractal geometry to everyday nature and yeah. i think that's absolutely crazy and i know is, that's awesome though i mean i'm glad to hear that you're learning how to communicate well that's awesome you know people want to be they want to be asked questions a lot of people are afraid to talk so they the more you ask them questions the more comfortable they'll get so that's awesome and then You know, also with this guy being a mathematician major, I can see how their interest in teaching them was less on nature, which is unfortunate because it is noticed in nature first. That's actually where this equation evolved from. So the fact that he didn't know the history about it is staggering to me. You know what I mean? That's crazy. But um, that's awesome as well. Like, I just want to touch on the fact that like, man, that's that's cool that you're talking more. And I try to tell people that stuff all the time. It's like, just say hello to people. <laughs> just say hi. Like, it's okay, man. Like, you have no idea where that that simple gesture is going to take you. You know what I mean? You're opening yourself up to so many opportunities. As in this golden ratio, it starts in this one little point, and it's just spiraling all the way out with freckles that he's talking about. You know, it's, it's a positive energy, man. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I just thought it was an interesting experience with a client, which is why I love the job that I have now. Um, yeah. But Makita, where do you apprentice out in Boston area? Um, so I'm in Abington um, at Skin Deep. My two studios in Abington. It's like South Shore. Oh, nice. And how long have you been apprenticing there? Three weeks. <laughs> nice. And how are you enjoying it? 
Um, it's fun. I'm really excited to be there. I'm happy for like the opportunity just to learn. Um, I did do tattoos like three years ago on my own. So I do know some stuff, but it's, I don't want to like, I want to stray away from what I thought I knew and learn everything I can. Um, but I'm loving it. You know, the, the people there are great. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, that's and that's a great mindset. <clears throat> I've always appreciated, and I haven't really talked to you quite often, but from what we have had in discussion, you have a very well um, head on your shoulders as far as the way that you need to be thinking realistically for yourself in a learning aspect. That's great that you <clears throat> are drawing as much as you are, that you're delving into the artistic world as you are. And at the same time, you're putting away all the things that you had learned years ago and in, in coming into this with an open mind. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. Um, like you said earlier, there's so many like resources and tools that we have nowadays to make tattooing so easy. Yeah. And I know it's easy for me to fall into that. Because like, you know, now I'm just stenciling stuff and drawing sketches that customers want. Um, so I don't really have much time at the studio to do what I want, but that's why I try to do it at home. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure being a mother, that's very tough. So, you know, very much kudos for you for joining this industry. <laughs> and we're happy to have you here as a introductory here. Um, but it's, it's in my apprenticeship, I did very similar things um, in my beginning stages. I mean, d is everybody in your shop using rotaries and cartridges? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I was, I, I think part of the tail end of everybody transitioning into t steel tubes and cartridges um, for my first, you know, six months, all I was doing is just washing everybody's tubes and everything like that. Um, but even in just doing that, I experienced so much. So I think, you know, what I, what I'd say to you is even in the smallest instances of what you're doing, you can experience and learn so much. Um, yeah. so take it all with a grain of salt and, you know, and love it and experience it because trust me, when you're big time tattooer and you're booked out for six months, you're going to remember and be humble to your apprentice days and remember where yeah. you came from. And yep, that's, exactly. that's something to take home. Um, oh, I'm, I'm very Hi. happy to uh, have you join here. What's, uh, what's your I'm little guy's Abel. name? Hello. Abel. This is Abel. Abel, look. Say hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. What's up, dude? <laughs> Did you want to show them your picture? Go get it. You dropped it before. Go Got get your picture. Got a little artist. Yeah. That's awesome. Come on, come on, come, on. come show me a picture. Hurry up. Mommy. Yes. Yeah. That's okay. Come on, we'll show them this one. Kids got Go a whole portfolio already. <laughs> so yeah. Show them this way. <laughs> this way. Look. Wow. What? Cool. Wow, this is cool. Check it I out. It. That looks awesome. Wow. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Go play. That's awesome. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely hard with the kids, but. Oh, I understand. Trust me. I do. That's awesome. That's Thank wonderful. Um, so we can go around. Uh, I do have a few minutes. Uh, we can go around. And if everybody has something that they want to share, uh, as far as how far they've come with their skull rendering of their portrait, now would yeah. be the time. Uh, do you have something, Cardo? Yeah, hang on one second. Let me get this. Uh, let me get them merged down real fast. Hang on one second. Okay, let me spotlight. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm using I'm using the skull that I have as an, an assistant. Okay. You know? uh, but I'm also uh, I have this photo here that I've been using as well. Okay. You see it. Yeah, that looks awesome. I like your palette. <laughs> Thanks. That'd be fun to go with like some reds and stuff like that. Yeah. Awesome. Is there, is there a glare on it? No, no, I can see it. I can see it actually very well. 
Um, so I'm going to ask you this question then. Is this helping you study in some sense, either the planes of the face, values, underlying compositions, fundamentals? What do you think this is a good exercise for? All the above. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's good. I think it's good for the planes for sure. You know what I mean? I think it's good for the planes. I think it's good for the that you stressed on the uh, the Terminator edge. You know, I'll show you real quick. Uh, one of the first things that I noticed with my drawing. Well, first of all, I desaturated it quite a bit. Um, let me bump it back up again. I wanted to desaturate it that way I could make the shapes out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, my phone's going crazy. That's okay. Uh, I'll show you this real fast. But I did notice. Right away was what you talked about earlier. Is that uh, uh, Terminator Edge? Yeah. And then I started establishing that for the skull right away. Yep. Yep. That was, that's the, that's the exact point that I'm, I'm very, very, very happy that you, that's exactly the route that you went with. Cause that's exactly the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Perfect. All right. Uh, Makita, do you have anything you want to share? You can, you can opt out, you can opt in whatever you'd like. Got a pin her here? Yes. Let me see. Move. All right. Let's see here. Um, all right. There should be. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I got it. Uh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So I kind I, of um go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. So tell me tell me all about this. I want to hear about it first before I say anything. So I've I've been watching before. Can you hear me over the baby? Sorry. Yes, yes, don't worry. He's okay. fine. So I've seen um like how Ricardo um did the uh, colors first for the shadows. And then I kind of did that with the girl's face and then went over okay. it, trying to um, pinpoint the skull structures. Okay. Um, I think I like that, like doing the whole shadow base first and then like chiseling out all the fine features. I think that is a lot easier for me than doing the stencil and then putting the shadows in, but that's not what this is. I was just saying that. Um, Oh, yeah, that's what I did. Okay. Um, so that looks great. Like you're really establishing um, proper bone structure in there. I think the, the I'm going to take your step process one step further here. Um, under your structured layer that you did, um, your colored layer, do the Loomis method first and then put that structured shape that, you know, Ricardo's method right over that. And that okay. way you can you can get a little bit more accuracy, and yeah, because this is what this whole assignment is to really show that the skull is underneath the face, um, and and that you can always map yeah. out the skull based off of the bone structures. And I think what yeah. may help you as well is turning your reference photo into a black and gray, so that all you have to focus on is value. Because I think seeing oh, okay. hues okay. is sometimes a little confusing. Um, but overall, you're doing a great job. You're really establishing things. You're really starting to play with structure. Um, you're doing an absolutely great job. Those are just a couple of things that may help you along the way. So to get a better end result for yourself. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, let me share mine here. Um, and I'm going to screen share actually. Good job, Nikita. Yes, excellent job. Okay. So I picked this Mila Kunis face. Um, 
because of the structure that's in here. So you see all your values are pretty much placed out. Um, and I started just mapping out where all of the defined structures that I see are just as a bottom base layer. I even established that the sphere is in there. So my brain knows consistently that my fundamentals are always there for me. Then I put a layer over it, mapping out where the bone structure is sloppily, but it's there. And then we go in and start fine tuning skulls. Okay. And from there, it just keeps building and building and building. And this is, will teach you to continue to layer and layer and layer. But at the same time, those structures are still there. You know, like all of this is a skull. And within that, you're learning your planes of the face. You're learning that here is coming out that way while down here is going down that way. Okay, you're, this is um, breadcrumbs for yourself. Okay, so um, anybody out there that is confused on how to start doing an exercise like that, best way possible. Don't freak out that you're, you know, getting sloppy right out of the get go. Be comfortable with being sloppy right out of the get go. Um, it's difficult to do that, especially when we're in the tattoo industry, because we're in the job of perfectionism. <laughs> So when we're doing any sort of painting or any other medium outside of tattooing, we want it to be just as perfect right away, which is not the case. It doesn't have to be the case, okay? Especially with digital, you can just double tap and it's gone, okay? So understanding your pro proper structures, understanding your planes, and you can see all of the similarities that are in here that are happening within that skull as well. And that is the process of that. Um, I will most likely have the finished rendering. I am not going to be that person that's going to take the skull that you do and put it over the face and be like, well, it's a little off. Not going to do that. That's not the uh, you know, point of this exercise. The point, once again, is to understand your fundamentals, to understand that the skull is underneath your face. So that needs to be taken into account first. And underneath that skull is basic structure, form, sphere, rhombus thing. Okay, so <clears throat> understand your fundamentals before anything. And for the fifth and final time, if you do not understand how to do a sphere or your proper values, you cannot expect yourself to get this far with a proper um, <clears throat> technical aspect in your dome. Okay, do not this this industry will tear you apart if you let it do not push yourself further than you are ready to be, if that makes sense. Um, and with that, I will start my sign off here. It was wonderful having you guys here. Um, thank you guys so much for coming down and hanging out. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. let me, let me spotlight myself. Uh, there we go. Um, all right, this will be my technical sign off here. Uh, that was a lot of information. And I know, and I'm sorry, uh, but the planes of the face have, do have their fundamental factors. If you do want to learn more about the planes of the face, definitely um, you can back this video up once it's done and log on to that Asaro Head um, website. Check that out. And I'll be posting some videos on how you can really learn the planes of the face a little more in depth with the bone structure and everything. Um, other than that, thank you guys so much. Thank you for reinventing the tattoo. Uh, next week, we will be starting into values. And um, Monday, I'll be on for the drawing group. So I hope I see some of you on there for hanging out. Nothing too serious class-wise, just hanging out and drawing and starting our morning right. Um, and once again, this is the Thursday morning fundamentals class. My name is Keir Franklin, first year tattooer, here to help you along your journey as well as myself. Thank you guys so much. Um, and this is the time to say goodbye. Oh, well